I'm Todd Martinez, and um, I'll be talking to you today about quantum mechanics and biology in various guises. And the um, first question that we should ask is whether there's any reason that we should be talking about quantum mechanics at all in the context of biology. After all, quantum mechanics is really so that what, what you all know to really be something that is um, or a, a discipline, if you want, that's really applicable to light particles. And the answer then, if, is quantum mechanics necessary for biology? The answer is yes, but mostly for light particles. And, the, and that might be the end of the story if you thought that <clears throat> proteins were really pretty heavy, being composed of you know, hundreds, thousands, or more of atoms. But you have to remember that these things are made up of, first of all, of atoms, and secondly, of electrons. And so the electrons themselves, anything that we ask about that is um, concerning electronic character is going to be strongly quantum mechanical. And that means that all of the force fields, that is all of the interactions between atoms, are going to be coming ultimately from quantum mechanics. Now, we may be able to somehow throw that under the rug. We'll talk a little bit about that, and you'll, you'll hear more about that, I think, later on. But, the, um, but ultimately, those force fields themselves do come from quantum mechanics. And to the extent that one needs to improve the force fields or to the extent that one needs to actually build new force fields for prosthetic groups, for example, that don't exist, that have just haven't been parameterized before, quantum mechanics is going to come into play. In the context of bond rearrangement, whenever we have um, an actual chemical reaction, then we're surely going to need to be dealing with quantum mechanics during whatever simulation it is that we want, because that is, again, a strictly electronic effect. And electron transfer, right, which is a, an important process in biology, and all electron transfer is dominated by quantum mechanical effects, by tunneling of the electrons, or if you prefer to think of it as, as um, non-adiabatic crossing. The nuclei, on the other hand, we have to worry about quantum mechanics a little bit less in this context. We could imagine, first of all, whenever protons are involved, we might actually be worried about quantum mechanical effects because of tunneling. And that, again, is actually, I mean, if, if you're going to talk about two processes which, <clears throat> which basically run through all of biology, especially bioenergetics, then you would probably name electron transfer and proton transfer. Now, What's unclear, there have been several um, speculate, well, I shouldn't say speculate, there have been several claims that tunneling was important in enzyme function, in various enzymes, and we can talk about some of that if you want. But, the, um, but it's still an open question as to how much importance there is to tunneling effects in biology, which occurs generally at room temperature. On the other hand, photobiology is actually a place where the quantum mechanical effects are inescapable, and that is because multiple electronic states are involved. So a photobiological process means I start out by exciting the electrons, and therefore I'm on a, I'm on a different electronic state. That is to say there are two potentials involved at least, one potential for the excited state that I start on and one potential for the ground state. And we'll see some, some of that later. But, the, but classical mechanics doesn't even make any sense if you have um, more than one potential energy surface. And so quantum mechanics is then needed. So let's talk about a few examples of cases where, of important um, cases in biology where this, is, where this is essential. And the first thing I want to talk about is cytochrome C oxidase. This is an enzyme which sits at the end of the respiratory chain in the mitochondria. And its function is essentially to take oxygen molecule take electrons, which come from the respiratory chain, and to take protons from, the, uh, from one side of the membrane, vectorially, and then to reduce oxygen to water, and to take the free energy that's gained from that, because that's thermochemically a downhill reaction, to actually pump four protons across. And so this is a particular system which actually combines all of the things that I was talking about, electron transfer, proton transfer through presumably some sort of water wire up to the, um, to the active site, and bond rearrangement, that is the reduction of oxygen. So a, a true simulation of that is going to need to treat quantum mechanics at many levels. Now, proton transfer, I just want to remind you of the sort of schematic sketch that people would, um, 
why you would think that proton transfer might involve tunneling. If you have, you have some sort of double well, which you would imagine coming about from protons moving in some sort of wire via some Grothaus mechanism, for example. So I have here some hydronium and then a set of water wire or a chain of waters. And then at some point, this, this proton can pop over to the middle, and then I have a hydronium in the middle, and then the, um, and I can consider this proton now to be in essentially a double well. It could either be bonded to this oxygen or this oxygen, and this is basically what I have. If I have a very heavy particle, then the levels, the energy levels that are appropriate are going to be very close to the bottom. If I have a lighter particle, then the energy levels are going to be higher up and closer to the top of the barrier, and the particle will be able to tunnel through the barrier. So there's two quantum mechanical effects here. One is the zero point energy. The fact that the lighter I am, the more likely I, the more, the higher I'm going to be, the closer I'm going to be to the top of the barrier. And the, and the second is actually the tunneling integral itself, or the coupling between being on the quantum mechanical state that's on the left and the quantum mechanical state on the right is going to be larger just because the barrier is smaller. So the second example that I want to talk about is bacteriodopsin. And this is a light induced proton pump. So essentially here we're going to take um, two of the effects that we were talking about, uh, multiple electronic states or a photobiological system coupled with proton transfer, again, possibly quantum mechanical, although it's, it, that, it, it's again unclear really to what extent that's true. But we're going to need quantum mechanics in order to describe the excited state, and we're going to need at the very least, even if we don't have any tunneling events associated with proton transfer, we're going to need bond rearrangement. And that's one of the reasons I showed you this, I reminded you of this Grothaus mechanism of protons moving through water wires, because the proton moving, even if it doesn't tunnel, it has to actually break bonds and make new bonds, right? So it breaks a hydrogen bond and makes a covalent bond, right? And again, that's going to involve electronic rearrangement, and so we're not going to be able to treat that effectively without treating quantum mechanics at some level or another. So basically, just to tell you what goes on here, you start out with a, pro with a proton on, well, bunch of protons on one side, come in with, um, with light, and then what that does is it, it makes this isomerize, which you don't see here, and then that moves this proton over to the other side vectorially from one side of the membrane to the other. Okay. So now we get to the meat of this, and that is first force fields, right, which really was the first thing, the first area in which I warned you or pointed out that quantum mechanics is going to play a big role. And these are really the building, as you've already heard, I'm sure these are the building blocks of biomolecular simulation. So I need to know, if I want to know how the atoms are going to move in time, then I'm going to need to know the forces that the atoms exert on each other. And in order to know that, I need to know the potential energy of various configurations. So I need to write down some potential energy function. And I can write something down schematically here. It's going to involve um, some sort of harmonic term involving the bond stretches, so that all these, these are a bunch of balls now connected by springs. Some harmonic terms involving the angles, possibly Fourier series, and some terms involving dihedrals and improper that I don't write. And then some sum over electrostatic terms and some sum over van der Waals type terms. So these are the, these are simply, the, this is the Coulomb interaction between the atoms where I consider these atoms to have charges on each one of them. So they're, ball, they're charged balls connected with springs. And what's more, these balls actually have some, um, they self-repel, right? So this is what this, po what this part is supposed to entail is actually the fact that I can't take two atoms and put them through each other, right? And so this is the repulsive part of van der Waals. But where does all this come from? In reality, what I need to do is solve the following equation, which is the electronic Schrodinger equation. So I have the electronic Hamiltonian, which is parameterized by the nuclear coordinates R, and it's inside, comes in some eigenvalue equation where there's an electronic wave function that involves the electronic coordinates and then in a parametric way the nuclear coordinates where all the atoms are and that has to be equal to some eigenvalue, the energy, times itself, right? So this is just the simple, this is simply the time independent Schrodinger equation. And I want to remind you of two things. First of all, that there are many solutions here. So this I can be, can, can range over many numbers. And the one that we're generally interested in in biology, with the exception of photobiology, is actually the, the first state. And the second thing is to remind you that this E electronic of R is actually exactly this V of R up here. That is, this, is the, this V of R is really a parameterization of the nuclear coordinate dependence of this eigenvalue. 
So we need to remember then what the electronic Hamiltonian is. It is essentially you know, going to be some operator because this is quantum mechanics. And the, there's some term that involves the kinetic energy of the electron. So I just sum over all the electrons. I have the kinetic energy of each of them. There's some term that is the Coulomb attraction, the Coulomb, the Coulomb attraction between the electrons and the point nuclei. And that's what you're seeing here. So the charge of the nucleus, and this is all written actually in atomic units. So the, um, just so that a lot of factors go away. And divided by the distance. And then some term, which is basically electron-electron repulsion. And finally, the nuclear-nuclear repulsion. Right, so this is basically what you should have seen before. And that's what we're going to need to solve, right? So if we want actually to know what the energies are as a function of R, in order to parameterize or in order to test a parameterization, then we're going to need to solve the electronic Schrodinger equation, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, as I've written it so far. And the way to do this is through ab initio quantum chemistry. Right? So that's just the name that people give to solving the electronic Schrodinger equation. Now, the good part about ab initio quantum chemistry, before we even get into any details, is that it provides a very well-defined hierarchy. So in principle, you always know how to improve your results. That's one of the things that I'm going to be trying to make sure that you understand at the end of all of this, is how do I actually know whether the answer is right? And one of the nice things about electronic structure theory over the last 20 or 30 years is that we've gotten to the point where anyone can run calculations to find out what the solution is to the time-independent Schrodinger equation. The trick, however, is knowing whether or not your results are worth anything. Right? And so, as in most computer simulations. So that's what we're going to have to, we're going to have to spend some time talking about. What's more, actually, there are prescriptions that are almost black box for a thermal chemistry, so for actually reaction, um, and heats of reaction, for example, that can almost invariably give kilocalorie per mole accuracy, at least in all cases where they've been tested. The problem is that these prescriptions are generally not practical for molecules of biological interest. Perhaps for ligands or for the um, fundamental reaction that's going on in an active site, if you want to know the heat of reaction in the absence of the enzyme environment, then you may be able to find that out very accurately. But to actually do this in, an, in, an, in a protein environment is going to be very difficult. And you'll see that as we go along. And the other thing that's very nice is that excited electronic states come out without any special treatment at all. They come out basically because of the fact that you're solving the Schrodinger equation. You get a stack of wave functions, each with its own electronic energy level. The bad is that periodic boundary conditions are quite difficult to implement. And we'll talk about some other techniques, which some people maybe would call ab initial quantum chemistry or a type of quantum chemistry, where that's not true. And that, for biology, is not that important. But the, what's more important is that they're very costly. And so even showcase calculations on greater than 200 atoms are really quite rare. It's only, it's really only in the last couple of years that people are starting, mostly because they're being motivated by biological problems, that people are essentially killing themselves to do 200 or 300 atoms, which is at least a reasonable fragment of a protein. All right, now in order to understand quantum chemistry, the first thing you have to understand is the, the so-called, what I'm going to call the canon. And that is, I mean, I made that up, I guess. But, but basically, but I didn't make up this graph. It's a, it's a two-pronged hierarchy. So the idea is that there are two directions in which you have to go in order to improve your answer. There's one region right here where your answer is garbage, right, or essentially. And that's basically the point where your treatment of the flexibility of the electron distribution is very, very low. And I'm going to call that your basis set, and we'll start talking about what that means. But, the, but your basis set is very small, which basically means that the electrons can't, don't have any freedom to move around at all. And the second direction is what we're going to call electron correlation, which is to say that electrons really, in real life, know full well that there's a Coulomb force between them. And so they, start, they try to stay away from each other. They know that they're both negative. But the first approximation that we're going to end up making is going to pretend that electrons only know about each other in some average way. And so that dynamically, they don't see each other. They see sort of some smear of negative charge over there, and they try to stay away. But they don't actually see instantaneously that other electron. Right? And so that's what we mean by electron correlation. It's physically a pretty easy concept to understand. So now, at this region, like I say, you have no electron correlation, and your basis set is so small that essentially you don't have to do the calculation. You know the result. 
it's just determined by, what, by the constraints you put in. You can move along this level and just start putting in more and more flexibility into um, the form of the electron distribution, but while retaining this treatment where the electrons don't really know about each other or only know about each other in this average way. And if you do that, you get an answer which you can give a name to, it's not right, but it's the complete basis set Hartree-Fock answer. You can also proceed along this direction with this really terrible basis set with very little flexibility, but putting in lots of electron correlation, and that leads you to something which again has a name, which is basically the minimal basis set full CI answer. Again, not the right answer. The right answer is actually up here. And the, what you're gonna wanna notice is first of all, the, the scaling just moving along in this direction is going to be at least n cubed nominally, right? It's possible to really, to, nowadays people are trying to, to see whether or not it's possible to, in the large limit, make this go as order n. But nominally, this is at least n cubed and possibly n to the fourth. And to move along this direction is factorial or exponential, right? And to move along, and when you move in the diagonal, it's actually factorial in n cubed, right? So essentially, you can never get here, even for almost anything. I've, People have gotten there for helium, but that's, that's about it. So all right, so how do you get, if you're faced with a problem like this, then you're gonna have to be very sneaky in order to solve it. And what sneaky really always means in the context of computational approaches is somehow putting in as much as you can of what you know the answer is. And the real strategy here is gonna be essentially to try to bootstrap the answer. So what you're gonna try to do, and then this is I mean, I think this is really quite global, but here it's, you know, it's been developed to an art. So essentially, you try to figure out, a priori, what do I know about the answer? Well, one thing that all of you know is that the electrons are gonna wanna be near the nuclei, right? So everybody knows that. The nuclei are positive, the electrons are negative. There's no doubt the electrons wanna be near the nuclei, and they don't wanna be in California if the molecule's in Illinois, right? So that we know, right? And that immediately we can somehow put in, right? And we can also put in something about the solutions of the atoms, which we might know. And then we can start to learn something about the molecule and try to contract the basis that we have. In other words, to generate a larger set of solutions than what we need, and then chop off the ones that, because they're high energy, or whatever might be the reason, generally because they're high in energy, they're not, we know they're not gonna be important, and then do something complicated in this smaller basis, right? And then continue to do this over and over and over again. And that's basically what you see here. So it's what I call the sort of never-ending contraction. The first thing you start with is the orbitals, the basis functions are gonna be the atomic orbitals, or well actually the first thing you start with are these orbitals which are the atomic orbitals or the primitives, right? And these basically are some sort of functions. They're, I'm sure you all know that these are going, these are gonna be something peaked around the atoms. They usually are gonna be taken to be Gaussians for reasons we'll talk about in a second. But if you remember the solution of the hydrogen atom from physical chemistry, at least, then you'll remember that it really should be an exponential function, right? So this, these should look like sort of like exponentially decaying functions, peak around the, uh, around the nucleus. And we're putting them all, on, we're labeling them already at the beginning with what atom they're on, right? So these things are all gonna be centered on the atom. They're then going, these are contracted into orbitals which are still on the atoms, but are so gonna be called contracted basis functions. And what's going on here is essentially that one can use these primitives as simply a way, basically you can generate this set of primitives in a way which expands the Hilbert space in a systematic way. And then you can go and solve, the way that you get these contraction coefficients right here, which normally you wouldn't solve for, they would be given to you in a program, but, they, but someone else solved for them. And the way they solve for these coefficients was essentially by solving for, solving the time independent Schrodinger equation for that particular atom in this basis set which was approaching completeness in this Hilbert space as best as possible. And then they say, okay, well what are the low-lying states? And now let me pull those out, the ones that are lowest in energy. And that gives me these contracted basis functions. Then the next step is to do, is to somehow build orbitals which are, or functions which describe the electron distribution which are somehow distributed a, a lot around the molecule, and those are constructed out as a linear combination of these functions, which are linear combinations of these other functions, right? So the key is that these coefficients remain fixed when I now put it into this equation and solve for these coefficients. This is what, this is actually is, uh, as you'll see in a minute, this is basically 
the, this uh, one electron basis set level, or what was the direction that I was calling the basis set direction in the, in the canon. Once I've built that, I have to build a many electron wave function, right? So once I have these orbitals, which are um, one electron functions, then I now need to build some many electron function. And the first thing I could build is a simple anti-symmetrized product of these orbitals. Now, why would I do that? Well, remember from quantum mechanics that these orbitals are related, they're, they're essentially wave functions for one electron, so they're related to probabilities. So if I have lots of different particles and I want to put them together, then the most obvious thing to do is just to multiply them, right, because they're probability functions. Now, I can't do that because of the Pauli principle, which you probably all remember as well. You can't put three electrons in one orbital. Right? You, can't, you can't put two electrons in the same orbital with the same spin. And so, they, so I have to actually somehow obey that anti-symmetry that, that is, comes from the fact that they're fermions, and that gives me, that means that this is the simplest recipe I could possibly write to get some wave function that was a function of many electronic coordinates. And this then is, this is basically a contraction. Again, it's a contraction in a, in a particular way that's dictated by symmetry. But the next thing I can do is actually take these functions and realize that actually there were many, many more orbitals coming out of this first equation than I needed, right? Remember I threw, just like here, I threw away the top, the high energy ones, but I didn't throw away everything. So that I left some that I didn't need. And that's what really happens at every point. There are some left over, there's some um, number of these functions that I don't strictly need. And so I'm going to use that flexibility again. And I use that flexibility again just by taking sums now over many of these anti-symmetrized products, where the only thing that's changed is basically what the, uh, what the index i runs over here, right? So some of these orbitals basically are different. In chemical terms, it's basically just saying I'm going to change the electron configurations, right? And this finally is then the total electronic wave function, which is a contraction of these anti-symmetrized products, which are products of contractions and contractions and so on, right? And you'll see actually this goes even farther than this later on. All right. So what about basis sets then? This is again the one particle part of the problem. The, the correlation energy was the many, part, many particle part of the problem. The basis sets are chosen to be centered on the atoms. That's because we, and what we're doing here, as I've mentioned before, is basically we're trying to embed what we know about the geometry of the molecule into the basis set itself. And we do that not only because we know that that's going to, that the solution should look like that, but also because then we know that as we change the geometry, the way in which, how close we are to the solution has more of a chance of being um, conserved, right? In other words, the, the sort of percent error we make is more likely to be constant if we, in fact, um, somehow embed this geometry into the basis set itself. And that's really one of the things, too, that you should notice is going on, that we're trying to bank on cancellation of error. We're trying to make sure that the errors, that all the errors that we know we're going to make are going to cancel out as far as possible. As the, ideally, we want this basis set to be exponentially decaying because that's, the, that's what the hydrogen atom solutions look like. But the problem here, and it also gives you the correct decay behavior for the density of a molecule, this is something that you may or may not have known from physical chemistry, but in fact you can prove that all molecules, the density has to decay exponentially. It has to decay with a, an exponential factor that's related to the ionization potential. So in fact, it's, you, you know, if you know the IP, you know the asymptotic form of the density. And that's basically just because it becomes asymptotically like a hydrogen atom. But then the integrals are intractable. And this was realized a long time ago, and so people, um, Moved to, moved to Gaussians, which were simply a type of function which didn't look exponential at all. In fact, actually, you know what? You know Gaussians from someplace else, right? Which is the solutions of the harmonic oscillator, right? Which doesn't look at all, if you remember the potential for a harmonic oscillator, it doesn't look at all like the Coulomb potential. And so you might not be surprised that when Boyce suggested this in like 1955 or something, was the original suggestion of this. He was, his office was moved to the bathroom of the, of, uh, in Oxford. But you know, that was basically because this was considered to be a nut, you know, a completely ridiculous suggestion. But it turns out that, I mean, he won in the end. But in fact, it wasn't a ridiculous suggestion at all. It, was, it made perfect sense. The idea is that if you get enough Gaussians and you put them together, you can make them look like anything you want, right? Just like any function. And furthermore, you can actually build a lot of the effort to make them look like the functions you want is built into this first contraction that you never do again. 
So it actually is not a big problem. Now, if you want to add basis functions, this is something that you'll find that you'll certainly run into if you start playing around with, um, well, if you start doing quantum chemical calculations, is you'll run into a point where you'll say, well, I want actually to get a bigger basis set in order to see whether or not I've converged with respect to this degree of freedom. And there are three references that I give you here. They'll be up on the web. They basically show you, just tell you in a systematic way, how do you add new basis functions to a basis set. So there are rules for this that are reasonably well developed. Now there is actually some in the, in the physics community, so those of you who, are, who come from a more physics background will know about the, the sort of ongoing debate between chemists and physicists, right, that, which takes many guises, but one of them is that you know, chemists like Gaussians in this context and physicists like plane waves. And they, um, well, I mean basically chemists, one of, one of my professors in grad school told me that, that chemists were just the Fourier transform of physicists. And it seems to be basically true. I don't know, Klaus. Are you a Fourier transform of me? <laughs> Chemists are the Fourier transform of physicists. <laughs> but in any case, so the so the Gaussians have the are they basically each one has its advantages. The Gaussians being atom centered means that you have the basis functions for sure in the important regions. You're not wasting your time putting them in regions that aren't important. On the other hand, the gradient of the energy is going to be very, and you know, I won't go into the details, but the gradient, the forces, computing the forces from this with respect to the, 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 the derivative of the energy with respect to the atom coordinates is going to be complicated. And it's going to be complicated because the basis functions are actually moving with the geometry. And so if you had fixed Gaussians, it wouldn't be complicated, but, if, but then you would actually lose all the benefits. So if you have Gaussians that move with the geometry, then you're going to need derivatives of the basis functions. It's a pain in the butt. Linear dependence also can be an issue because if you keep putting lots of Gaussians in the same place, they all look the same after a while, right? Plane waves have the advantage that since they're constructed to be orthogonal, they don't all look the same ever. Basically, you have a systematic way to expand the Hilbert space. But they're localized, and that's really good for reducing scaling. And so, in fact, and that's, I mentioned that really already before, people are trying to get, um, to make these kinds of methods scale, at least asymptotically, linearly, and you can't do that if you don't have localized basis functions because the local is spatial localization that gives you that. There is no momentum localization in the problem, or at least not enough, not enough to do it. Plane waves force a periodic description. And this could be good, but it can also be really bad because if, and in biological context, it's typically bad because you don't, if you're doing some active site of a truncated piece of a molecule, you don't want it to be periodic. You don't want it to feel other enzymes at the other side, and so then you have to put a lot of space between them, which means actually that your basis set now has to be much bigger because it has to span the whole space. The gradients, however, are trivial, and that's a good thing, but you need many, many more basis functions, and offsetting this to some extent is the fact that the integrals are much easier. So in the end, this is more or less, more or less a matter of taste, although I think in the biological context it's pretty clear that Gaussians are what you want to use. So now if you go and start using a quantum chemistry program, the first thing that you need to know is all the, well, I mean, you have to know like a million keywords, right, or code words and acronyms, and it's like this sea of acronyms, right? And, they, and so you have to have some Rosetta Stone to get you into this. Otherwise, you, well, otherwise you just don't know what you're doing. So the, so the first thing I want to do is really give you an idea of basis set classification so, so that you know what kinds of basis functions there are and then, um, and then I'll give you a sort of key to the ones that are really important. Because actually, after, after 30 years of this, there really are only a handful that are really important. Most of them you actually don't have to worry about. So the first thing is our, our minimal basis sets. And this is a, a code word that means that you have exactly one contracted basis function for every occupied orbital on an atom. So that means that hydrogen has one s function. Carbon has, the, has two s functions, one for the one s, one for the two s and it has one set of p functions, right? And that's it. That's the lux, but if you had a basis set that was smaller than that, you wouldn't have any place to put the electrons, right? And that's the point. The, an n zeta basis set <coughs> is telling you that you have n contracted basis functions per occupied orbital on an atom. So double zeta or triple zeta just means that you have two or three times the number of basis functions you would have in a minimal basis set. Valence n zeta, which you'll see people use as well, say is, um, a particular word that means that the core 
So the innermost electrons, that's the 1s of carbon, and for silicon it would be the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p, are minimal, but you have n zeta for the valence part. Polarized means that you have higher angular momentum functions than in a minimal basis set. And that means that on carbon you would have d functions instead of p, which is where the valence stops. On hydrogen you would have p functions instead of just s, where the valence stops. On transition metals you would have f functions, and so forth. And we'll see what that really means in a second. Diffuse or augmented are two words that mean the same thing, and they mean just adding much wider functions, that is, much broader functions with small exponents is what it ends up meaning. And this is done in order to describe weakly bound electrons or Rydberg states. But what you need to, which makes it sound like you would never want to do, you would never care about this in biological context, but that's not true. Because diffuse and augmented functions, weakly bound electrons are what you have whenever you have an anion. Right? So anything that has significant anionic character is going to be strongly polarizable. That polarizability is basically just saying that the electron cloud can distort very easily, which is saying that there's some contribution of some broad, diffuse state. Right? And if you don't have those basis functions in there, then you won't be able to get it right. And so it's generally not something you're going to want, but if, you have, but if there are anions involved, it is something that, that one should actually be worried about. So what is the physical interpretation of these basis functions? I mean, you could. You could just say at this point, well, look, you know, the more basis functions you have, the more complete, and so all you need is to make n large, where n is the number of basis functions. But that doesn't really, well, first of all, that strategy doesn't work very well because you have to, again, what I was saying before, you have to important sample. You have to actually sample, expand the Hilbert space in a way in which it's going to capture the important effects. But what's more, it doesn't give you any insight into what's going on. So here I'll just show you very simply what's going on if you increase n in an n zeta basis set. So if I have some, I'm just talking, I'm thinking here about a, a, a hydrogen atom or something along those lines, it's some s orbital. And so here's my small s orbital, and here's my large s orbital. And if I have two of these and I, allow, and I add them with coefficients that are allowed to vary, then what I can do is I can make small orbitals and big orbitals. In other words, I let the molecular orbitals breed, right? Or I let the electron, what I allow is a radial expansion of the charge distribution, right? And that's exactly what I'm doing, right? Nothing more, nothing less. On the other hand, if I put in polarization functions, these are the functions, remember, of higher angular momentum. So for the case um, like hydrogen again, I would be taking some s orbital and adding in some p function. Well, what do you get if you take an s orbital plus a p? Well, you can take the s plus the p where the p has zero coefficient, you just get an s. Or you can start adding more of the p with positive sign or more of the p with negative sign. And then what you see, what you get is basically an orbital, an s orbital, at least in the limit of these coefficients being small, you get an s orbital that's pooched to one direction or another. Right? So, so it goes this way or it goes that way. And in general, if you do this with a p function, you add in d functions, you take a p function, you allow it to bend. Right? And so really what's, what this is doing, what polarization functions do, is they allow um, all of the orbitals to bend. And that's exactly what you should expect you're going to need. So the charge distribution is allowed to, to bend off of the valence, the normal valence constraints. That's what it's going to need if I have bonds which are strongly contorted. So if I think about transition states, regions between a reactant and a product that's some barrier, which is unfavorable by definition, then at those locations, I would expect that polarization functions should be very important. And they would be less important for the reactant and the product. And in fact, this is true. And so this, again, if you, um, what you really want to know here is that extra valence and polarization functions are going to be most important when the bonds are stretched or the atoms are overcoordinated. So what do you really need to know? What you really need to know at the end is really only three things. That there are the, the last minimal basis set that anybody would even put into a code nowadays, although some codes for historical reasons have a gazillion. But the last one that anyone would actually code would be STO3G. And that's just the particular name of a, um, of a minimal basis set. The, there is reason actually to use these, even though I've been, I've sort of berated this all the time and said this is a Mickey Mouse, right? But that doesn't, there's a good reason to actually want to have a minimal basis set available. And that's because a minimal basis set has very few degrees of freedom. Therefore, finding the solution is going to be very easy. It has a solution encoded in it in some way because the basis set itself was built essentially to get the right solution for a large number of cases. And so as a starting guess, this is actually a very reasonable thing to do. Just take a minimal basis set 
to solve the electronic Schrodinger equation and to use that in order to ramp up to larger basis sets. And you find that if you do any of this, any significant amount of this, you'll find that you have to do that quite a bit. The um, second set of basis sets are these Popol style basis sets, which are just given these names M dash N1, N2, N3 up to NX, G. And these are X zeta, where X is just the number of numbers between the dash and the G. And the M here means the number of primitives in the core. So the core in all of these are all valence X zeta basis sets. So the core is minimal. And the number of primitives in the core is what M means. And N sub I, each of these little Ns, means the number of primitives in the ith valence AO. So the ones that are, there are a number of these. The ones that, that you might think of using are 321G. The only reason to use this is because for some reason that no one really understands, it gives pathologically good geometries for closed shell molecules in the sense that they're much, much better than they should be. And that's because of a cancellation of errors. This is a well-known folklore in quantum chemistry. That essentially, 321G Hartree-Fock will give you better geometries than something that costs you five times as much. And so it's a good thing to know. It's <laughs> because actually it's the, well, for that, exactly that reason. But it's for the wrong reasons that it works. It's basically because the errors cancel out. The um, 631G, 631G star, and 631G double star are the basis that you'll probably see the most. These are essentially now, they're reasonable basis sets. And the star, one star means that you have polarization on non-hydrogen. So there are polarization functions on carbon and oxygen and so forth. And two stars means that you have polarization functions on all of them. So this is the order in which they go in size. 631 is smaller, 631 star is larger, and star star is larger still. And the, um, and the pluses just mean that it has diffuse functions. And again, one plus means you have diffuse on non-hydrogen atoms, and two pluses means you have diffuse on all the atoms. You can also combine this and do 631G star star plus plus. These basis sets are really popular, but they're not actually the best basis sets. The best basis sets are Almost everyone would agree that the be best basis sets are actually these correlation consistent, so CCPVXZ, where X again is the, there, these are valence X zeta again, and so like CCPVDZ is a double zeta basis set that's nominally equivalent to 631G star star, and CCPVTZ is a triple zeta basis set and so forth. The reason that these are better is actually because they um, expand, the, is not really, CCPVDZ is better than 631 star star, it's also larger. But the reason they're better is not actually that. The reason they're better is actually because they form a hierarchy that is well-defined. So CCPVDZ to CCPVTZ to CCPVQZ to CCPV5Z, right? As you go on and you just increase X, you actually have essentially the closest thing possible to an equispaced um, distribution in Hilbert space, whatever the heck that means. What that means is basically if you go and you try to look at, you try to look at a property as a function of basis set size, and you try to extrapolate it, that actually the extrapolation will follow an exponential curve. That's what it means. Right? I mean, that's, tech, that's mathematically what it means. But what it means in, in practice is that convergence is, is monotonic, whereas with other types of basis sets, the convergence will actually sometimes oscillate. Actually, often, most of the time, will oscillate. And so and that's really annoying. If you can only do a couple of calculations, then it's annoying to see your property go like this and like that and like this and like that. Right? You'd much rather that it go down and converge smoothly. They are, however, larger than the Popal sets, not in terms of the final number of functions, but in terms of the number of functions that, they're, that they contract. Right? And therefore, they're slightly more expensive, but not by a lot. OK, so Hartree-Fock. So if we truncate the many particle basis set down to only one term, then we get Hartree-Fock. And that's what we have here, which basically is this anti-symmetrized product of these contracted orbitals, which are these molecular orbitals. And you can, be, it can, you can show pretty easily, and I won't, but that this implies some nonlinear effective one particle problem. That in fact, there is nothing, all you have to do is say this, and that the wave function has to satisfy this onsatz, and you're going to solve for these coefficients. And you have, you have already said that the electrons only see each other in an average way. Right? And that may make sense to you from what I've said already, but but, the, um, but that, in fact, is, well, whatever, it's a fact. So basically, there's going to be, if this is an effective one electron problem, then that means there must be some one electron operator. And indeed, there is this Fock operator, which is, now the important point is that this is actually a function of the solutions itself. Right? So this one electron operator 
is a function of the solution, so you can't, you have to actually iterate to solve it. And the um, form of this is some one electron part plus some Coulomb part, so this is just written as um, J sub J, well, whatever, it's, it's, cool, it's a Coulomb integral, okay, so some Coulomb, dis Coulomb interaction, and then some exchange part that comes from the anti-symmetry that I won't talk about too much, I'll say something about it a little bit later. So, the, so what this basically means is that the time, the time independent many particle Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi, goes to F of phi times phi equals epsilon times phi, right? So it becomes a nonlinear one particle equation from this many particle equation. So the self consistent field procedure is, you know, for anybody that doesn't know this already, is basically that you guess the solution. If you know the solution by guessing it, then you can build that operator, and if you can build that operator, then you can solve this linear equation pretty simply, and then you can check and see whether the coefficients that come out are the same as the coefficients you put in, and if they're not, then you keep on iterating, and that's basically the story, right? So it's the same way any naive person would solve a nonlinear equation. There actually are much, much, real codes won't, they won't do it quite as naively as I said, but that's basically the idea. So what you're gonna see then is, is that you're gonna see calculations converge or not converge. And what you want to notice is just like any nonlinear problem, if it doesn't converge, then it means, well, first of all, you have to check whether it converged, right? Just like you have to check all of these things and see whether they really work. You have to check whether it converged, and then you have to actually, at each level, so there's going to be many levels of convergence, but you have to check whether the electronic structures, whether the Hartree Spock or whatever converged. And then actually you're going to have to check the, um, if it doesn't converge, actually, then you're going to have to actually figure out what to do. And what to do, the only thing that you have to do there is change your guess for the solution, right? And so that's basically what you have to do, is figure out how to change your guess for the solution. There are lots of tricks to that. One of the tricks, which I'll just mention, is actually to solve for a, um, a molecule with a positive charge. So basically to solve for the cation. And the reason is because if you solve for the cation, this basically is just like what I said about minimal basis sets. What are you trying to do? What you want to do is remove freedom from the problem and then put it back in slowly, right? And so removing, making a, a molecule into a cation is removing freedom because now the electrons are shoved into the nuclei more. They don't feel the repulsion, the Coulomb repulsion between them is not, that balance is basically tilted now towards the nuclei. It's very easy to find the solution, right? And so then you can basically then move the charge back. The, um, okay, so now we actually have to say, well, what's wrong with Hartree Fock? There's a lot of things wrong with Hartree Fock, but it's very easy to see there's really two basic types of things wrong with it. And the first thing is what we're going to call static correlation. And I don't know why it's, well, it's called static correlation because it's not dynamic. And I guess static is the opposite of dynamic. So if we consider a Hartree Fock wave function at dissociation for H2, then we'll be able to see the problem. Here are the molecular orbitals. They're going to be some sigma orbital, which is just the plus combination of the left and the right. So I just take the AO on the left plus the AO on the right, and some sigma star antibonding, which is left minus the right. The Hartree Fock wave function is just going to be the anti symmetrized product of these two orbitals, um, which are the same, because we're going to put both of the electrons in the sigma orbital and the bonding orbital, times the spin function, which makes them a singlet. Now, at finite r, these two orbitals have some splitting. Right? There's some energy gap between sigma and sigma star, and putting two electrons in this one orbital is perfectly reasonable. But when I go to infinity, then the energies of those two orbitals are the same, and so I have something that looks like this, and I don't know whether I should put two electrons on this side or I should put two electrons on this side, but my onsatz doesn't allow me to put one electron here and one electron here, and so I'm toast. Right? I'm toast because of near degeneracy. Essentially, I'm, my onsatz is forcing me to break degeneracy, or to break symmetry, if you like. So if I expand into AOs, I can see what that means. Basically that I have the um, chi left, chi left, plus chi right, chi right, plus left, right, plus right, left. And what that is telling you is that if you prefer to think in, in a slightly different um, framework, you would say that this wave function is constrained to have ionic character, because this, is, this has two electrons on hydrogen on the left and two electrons on hydrogen on the right, and that's being mixed equally with what is really the correct solution, just h dot h dot is what it should actually associate to. What this is telling you is that you need more than one determinant. Right? That's and, the, um, and you can try to solve this without using more than one determinant. And that's this restricted versus unrestricted. So again, you'll see these keywords running around, restricted Hartree-Fock, restricted cone sham, which we'll talk about in a minute, unrestricted. 
So you can solve the previous problem by allowing the orbitals to be singly occupied, by which what I mean is allowing these two orbitals to be different. So allowing one of those bonding orbitals to be different from the other one. The problem with this, I mean, because what, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen is you're going to have one electron on the left, one electron on the right. It's exactly what you wanted, right? So it's going to collapse to because it's able to. But the problem is this is not a spin eigenfunction. Spin is an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Therefore, all wave functions that are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian should be eigenfunctions of spin. And this is not. And you can easily verify this because basically what it does is it distinguishes the right and the left electron. And that's equivalent to violating spin eigenfunction character because spin operator is a permutation operator. But, but in any case, well, which may or may not be very clear, but, the, but, the, uh, but, that is, but it's true. So you can ask why we didn't just write, and then, well, you can see that actually very clearly if you just uh, ask why we didn't write the following function where I have phi prime before phi, uh, excuse me, sigma phi, phi sigma prime before phi sigma. So all I've done here is to reverse the order of these two orbitals. And these are, in fact, two different wave functions. You can prove that if you go and build the determinant and so forth. And there doesn't seem to be any reason to prefer one over the other, but I have. I've written just one of them. And in fact, the pure spin state, to make it a spin eigenfunction, what you do is you just take plus and minus combinations of these and you get a singlet and a triplet out. Right. So now you may or may not think that that means anything, but in fact, it does mean a lot. If you're not a spin eigenfunction, if you start with a wave function that violates Essentially, what you're doing is you're violating a basic symmetry of the problem. Now you're going to try to perturb away from that, and you should know you're going to be toast. I mean, how are you going to get back? How in the world are you going to get back a symmetry that you threw away? It's going to, you can do it, but it's going to be slow, and you're going to have to fight against that. So this is not really a very good idea. The, um, so then the question is, how do we describe correlations? So I will move on to, to just to actually just starting to describe dynamic correlations. The um, easiest way to do this is what's called, it was referred to the perturbation theory, usually in the mahler plesset form. There are many ways to write perturbation theory, and the only one that anybody uses nowadays is mahler plesset But what you do here is basically just define your zeroth order Hamiltonian to be the true Hamiltonian minus the Hartree Fock, Fock the sum of Fock operators, right? So this is the, um, that should act, that's right, that's H0, and then V is just the, the difference, so that H0 plus V is the real Hamiltonian. But what's been shown is that actually this series, it's been shown unequivocally that this series diverges for stretched bonds, right? That not, not only does this series not, you know, oscillate, the series it formally diverges, right? And that you can show that for, even for H2, it formally diverges, right? So this is really, this is, it seems a little bit, a little bit of a, um, a dangerous thing to use. And in fact, what I'm trying to point out here, because many people have this, I, people that, that are new to quantum chemistry and start running programs and so forth, they, you know, they remember from physical chemistry that perturbation theory is a series, and they remember that it's better to be 50th order than to be first order, right? And so they think that, oh, that I'm allowed to do MP3 and MP4 and MP5, so I should go and do all of those. And actually, you shouldn't. This is the kind of series that's mathematically known as a... Um, but basically Borel summable. But I mean, it's a, it's a kind of series where the first term, the second order correction is the first correction. The first term is useful and is meaningful. But after that, the series is, is, just, is just noise. Right? So, the, so you should never go beyond MP2 for anything. More stable than that is um, configuration interaction, where basically you solve for the CI coefficients variationally. So what's happening in the perturbation theory is that you're solving for the various coefficients of those determinants with um, perturbation theory, and in CI, you just solve for them with variational method. Now, I want to introduce this, not, this notation because it's going to make it really easy to explain something else later, and that is that we'll write the CI wave function as some operator multiplying the original wave function, the SCF or the Hartree-Fock wave function. And this operator is first just some number plus some X creation annihilation operators, right? So basically, I just kill an electron in orbital I and create one in orbital A. So orbital i is one of the occupies, and orbital a is one of the ones that didn't have anything in it, and multiply that times some coefficient. Now I have to solve for these coefficients, and I can write this, I can imagine the series going on forever until I run out of, um, until I have so many uh, annihilation operators or destruction operators that I can't actually, that I get zero. And so it will truncate at some point at the number of electrons. But the, um, but typically, you have, you have to truncate this at some excitation level. If you don't truncate it at any excitation level, then you have full CI, 
and you've completely expanded the, you have every determinant that's possible, right? They, but anyway, all this is, so, but, but if you actually um, truncate it at some particular level, then you don't have full stack. Now you can do that, and we'll, I'll say a few words about why, whether you want to or don't want to do that in a minute. But the first thing to think about is they, is before we do that, is about multi-determinant hartree fox So we have now a CI type of problem where we just, where we have actually split this into an orbital optimization problem, where we have this one determinant, we try to get the orbitals, and then we actually make many determinants and try to get the coefficients. And what you could imagine doing is actually solving for both of those at the same time. And so doing this simultaneously, this CI and this, um, this um, SCF. And in fact, that's really, that's probably the most powerful of the traditional methods where, and in particular in this form called CAS SCF, or complete active space. So what this means is that you take some set of orbitals where you know the electronic occupation is going to vary, and the determining how big that set should be is something that is left to your experimentation. But, um, but once you have that set, then you take all rearrangements within that set, and you solve for the orbitals at the same time as for the CI coefficients. Right, so basically, you're solving for dynamic correlation, the actual electrons seeing each other, at the same time that you're solving for this stretched bond problem. And, the, um, and for H2, it's pretty clear what you would do. You would just take the sigma and sigma star orbitals, because in a minimal basis set, that's all there is. And so you'd have an active space with two orbitals, and you'd have two electrons in it, because that's all there is. And there would be three configurations involved. All right, so that's called CAS SCF. Now, the, one of the things that people talk about a lot in quantum chemistry and that you need to know is about size consistency. And, the, and what size consistency means is just that the, is, is what everybody knows from kindergarten, that the energy of a set of objects which are infinitely separated, where there are n of them, should be n times the energy of one of them, right? It's just extensivity. But that, and that sounds like a really trivial requirement, but it's actually not met by many quantum chemical methods. And so the, that's bad. And truncated CI is one of those. So trunc that's why I actually didn't go into that in too much detail. If you truncate CI at a particular excitation level, if you do full CI, it does meet it. But if you truncate it at a particular excitation level, it does not. And the reason for that is because the energy should be an additive object for non-interacting systems. But if the energy is additive, then the wave function should be a product. And so if the, what is it that maps products into sums is really what you need to ask. And the map mathematically that does that is the exponential. So if what you were to do, what that's really telling you is that the wave function should not have been a sum of this, these operators. It should have been a set of product, uh, it should have been actually an exponential. And that would guarantee that the energy would be additive. And that basically is a very off the cuff way to derive the following form where I basically take exactly the CI expansion up here. Again, these annihilation and creation operators and these coefficients that I don't know, but I just exponentiate that before I operate on size zero. If you expand this, then what you're going to find, I mean, you can just expand the series on paper yourself, and what you're going to find is that, there, that even if you truncate this at, at the, right here at second order, right, so I truncate just the single excitations and double excitations, then effectively I actually have infinite fold excitations because the exponential has all these powers in it, right? And, that is and this is actually, um, Probably, well, actually, CCSDT, which is a particular variant of this, has been called over and over again the gold standard in quantum chemistry. It's very expensive, but, the, but it's possible, actually, to do this for molecules of the order of 50 atoms or so. You can get a kilocalorie per mole accuracy out of it, but, the, but it can fail for bond breaking because there aren't any good multi-reference versions. And this goes back to remember what we were saying with the static correlation that basically the reason that we had problems when we tried to break H2 apart was because of this near degeneracy, and we didn't have any, we didn't have the other determinant, right? So what we really needed was to have, to be able to have two electrons on the left or two electrons on the right, and then we would have solved the problem because we would have treated the two orbitals the same way. And there aren't any really good multi-reference versions of this, which means that when you start breaking bonds, it starts to fail. So at this point, you basically say, well, is there another way to do all of this? And you know, actually, you probably all know that there's another way. And the, um, the other way is density functional theory. So what density functional theory does is to replace the wave function as the fundamental unknown, because that's what we were doing just a minute ago. We were basically solving, finding all these coefficients, which were going to tell us what the electronic wave function looked like. 
and it replaces that with the charge density. Now, there's a huge difference here because the wave function is a 3n coordinate function, but the density only depends on three coordinates. Right? So you go from 3n to 3. And now you should basically, well, and I can tell you an empirical fact that density functional theory is not can be. It almost, almost in, well, okay. You have to do certain things. But DFT can be, and in normal usage, is much better than Hartree Fock. And so this should be a puzzle. I mean, how in the world could that possibly be? If I go from 3n degrees of freedom to 3, then how could it be that, I'm actually, that I have a, a, an ansatz that's better? And the answer actually comes in the DFT expression for the energy. So the, in DFT, basically, you take the energy as a functional now of the density. And what does functional mean? It just means that a functional is something that takes a function and returns a number. So a definite integral is a type of functional. If I, take the, if I define the, some functional i to be the definite integral from a to b of a function, then that will give me some number. And therefore, the, therefore this is a recipe for a functional. The, but it, this functional now is defined as some part, which is the kinetic energy, some part, which is the electron nuclei attraction, which actually you know how to write. It's just going to be the integral of the density times the potential induced by the nuclei. Some electron-electron repulsion part, which you also know how to write, almost, but not quite, and we'll say why that's not quite right. And then some other part that you have no clue what it is, which is basically this exchange correlation. And this part has to have in it the exchange integrals that I didn't talk too much about, and this dynamic correlation that we've talked about before. Now, the reason this can work is because the exchange correlation functional is completely unknown. And in fact, it's unlikely to ever be known in a form which is simpler than solving the electronic Schrodinger equation. So in fact, this is actually all a circle. It says that you can take this, this three n dimensional function and you can reduce, get all the information you want with a three dimensional function as long as you know some functional map which requires you to actually know the three n dimensional function. Right? And so that's really what this is. It's a game. But it's a game that's fruitful. It's very fruitful. It's not, that's, this, isn't, this is not meant to be a criticism just telling you how this can work from an information theoretic standpoint. Otherwise, it would be very puzzling. So there's something else that's not often said, and that's that the kinetic energy functional, that T of rho that I wrote, is also unknown. And the reason that people don't stress this too much is because you can approximate it if you associate the density with a wave function. And that's what's called Koncham. So the Koncham idea is that I'm going to write a wave function as an anti-symmetrized product. And you should look and say, well, gee, that looks a heck of a lot like hartree fock And it does exactly the same thing as hartree fock And then the density that comes from this wave function is just the sum of the squares of the orbitals. And that you can, I mean, that's basically simple math. Now, if I believed that that density actually was associated with this wave function, then I could compute the kinetic energy because I have the wave function. So I just take the kinetic energy operator and put the expectation value between two wave functions, and that is a bunch of integrals, and I can evaluate it. The thing that's funny here is that the density here doesn't, I mean, it doesn't, it can't actually come from this wave function because then I would be doing hartree fock right? So something is a little bizarre. And in fact, what that means is that this exchange correlation functional has in it some piece which comes from the difference between the kinetic energy approximation and the kinetic energy in real life. And no one knows really how to do, how to quantify how much of it is and how much of it's not. But now you need to define KXC in order to make any progress at all. And the important point to notice is that the ansatz that we're going to use is going to be exactly the same as hartree fock The only difference is going to be in this Fockian operator. So the Fock operator is still going to be a nonlinear. It's still going to be a function of its solutions. It's going to look you know, exactly the same in this one electron part, exactly the same in this Coulomb part, and then possibly similar in this exchange part. We'll talk about that in a second. But then the important point is that it's going to have this extra thing, this KXC, which is going to be a functional of rho and possibly, we'll talk about this in a minute too, of grad rho, the, the derivative. And we basically do exactly the same SCF procedure as in hartree fock so it actually, so density functional theory is of, of cost, which is basically equivalent to hartree fock So now how do you get, how do you actually figure out what this KXC is? Well, there's one, there's one way, there's one case in which you do know the exchange correlation functional. And the reason that you know it is because in this one particular case, someone who actually is in this building, David Sepperly, worked his tail off to actually get the answer, the exact answer for the particular case of the homogeneous electron gas. So you have an, a, a 
constant uniform density of electrons in a periodic box, just replicated over and over again, and you work really hard and you get the answer for every density, right, using quantum Monte Carlo techniques. If you can do that, then you can actually, or assuming that you, know, that you did do that already, we can now take advantage of that. And the way that you take advantage of that is that you just make the assumption that the density varies very slowly. So that it's basically, then this would work perfectly if the density was completely uniform. You're just going to get back the number that you've already tabulated. So you write then the exchange correlation of the uh, functional of the density just to be the integral essentially over the exchange correlation functional you know at every point divided by the volume, which is the same thing as saying that I take a density, I make it piecewise constant, and then in every domain where I've made it piecewise constant, I read off the number from the table, and then I add them all together with the appropriate volume elements. Right? The problem with this, and this is what people did you know, from quite a long time ago, the problem with this is the errors are large. They're not even large, they're, they're huge. They're up to like 30 or 40 kilocalories per mole, which if you remember, you know, typical of strong you know, macho covalent bond energy is 60 or 70 kcals per mole. The hydrogen bond is two to three kilocalories per mole. So if you're off by 30 kilocalories per mole, you know, this is just laughable, right? And in fact, it was laughable for a long time. But the, but people figured out at some point what the problem was, and they, well, actually they figured that out very quickly, but then figuring out how to fix it was the problem. But the, but the basic way to fix it was to do a piecewise linear approximation of the density. So instead of doing piecewise constant, you do something that's piecewise linear. And the problem here is that the exact results for the linearly varying density are not known, right? And, and are very, would be very difficult to get. And because of that, there actually are, there's more than one gradient corrected functional, that is functional that makes this piecewise linear approximation of the density. The, there's only one local density approximation, which is what I just talked about before. That's it, because you have exact results. In this case, the exchange correlation functional becomes a functional of the density and the gradient of the density, so that you can make this piecewise linear um, expansion. And examples of this are, you know, again, sort of this acronym SOUP, are BLIP and PW91. This is much improved, but the errors can still be up to about 10 kilocalories per mole, so you're not really quite there yet. And if you want to really get there, then what you do is you do the, what they, they, these um, functionals they call hybrid functionals, where basically you notice that something that I just completely um, wiped over before was that I wrote the Coulomb interaction as the integral over the two charge distribution divided by the distance. But that's not right, because that actually has every electron interacting with itself. I mean, it has the charge density interacting with itself at every point. And so there's some self-interaction of the electrons, which I've counted, which I shouldn't have. And if you look back in Hartree-Fock and analyze it in some detail, you would find that it's the exchange integral that actually subtracts that, right? So that J, that Coulomb part is the same in Hartree-Fock and BFT. It's just that the exchange exactly cancels the self, the self interaction in um, Hartree-Fock. So what someone came up, well, actually Beckett, came up with the idea that maybe if I just added in a little bit of Hartree-Fock exchange, that that would improve things, right? And you could ask, well, why don't you just add in all of the Hartree-Fock exchange, and that gets you into a, an hour-long lecture, so you don't want to hear the answer. But, the, um, but, the answer but, but it turns out that you should add in just a little bit, and B3LIP is the particular acronym for the most popular functional of this type. And in this case, errors go down to 3 to 5 kilocalories per mole in most cases, and it still costs basically the same as Hartree-Fock. So this is actually, now that's not, that may not be good enough for you, and if it's not good enough for you, you have to go back to everything I said before. If that is good enough for you, then maybe you're, that's the way you want to go, right? So this is why I'm giving you the whole plate so that you know what's, what's going on. There's another way to understand this, and that's empirically, that Hartree-Fock and DFT behave actually quite differently. Hartree-Fock has no electron correlation at all, and that means that if you have severely stretched or distorted bonds, you're going to have serious problems, right? Again, back to this H2 and the static correlation. That means that Hartree-Fock is going to disfavor over-coordination, right? It's going to disfavor stretching of bonds and so forth. Pure DFT, on the other hand, overestimates correlation. And that, you know, to understand, it's just an empirical fact. And so it has a preference to over-coordinate. And so hybrid functionals basically cancel the errors out. Right? That's another way to understand. Now, um, the DFT alone can be very useful, but Hartree-Fock alone is never very useful, and that's because the barriers are usually overestimated by way more than DFT underestimates them. But in fact, the, um, 
this leads you actually to the next point, which is, well, should I just do DFT and forget about everything else? And the answer to that is not really. Because even the best DFT often give you errors of five kilocalories per mole. And in fact, it's sort of three to five kilocalories per mole has been, has basically people have come to believe that that's a floor. That, that as it stands, that with the current way that the machinery works, it's not possible to go below three to five kilocalories per mole. There has to be some qualitative or conceptual change before that's gonna be done. That will probably eventually come, but at least right not right now. The second problem is that there's no hierarchy for improvement at all. It doesn't make any sense. No one should go and do calculations and calculate some proton affinity, for example, of a residue and, and calculate it with blip and then calculate it with PW91 and calculate it with every one of these, you know, have 50 functionals, just calculate it with every single one and then take the one you like. You should never do that, although some people do. But you should never do that because you'll get a whole range of numbers and you'll find one that you like. But the problem is that the next residue you go to calculate the PKA for, it's gonna be a different one that gives you the right answer. And this, so people have tried this already, and it doesn't work. The, um, and that's problematic because it means that if you really wanna know that the answer is right, you don't, have any way to, you don't have any way to really to push it at all. You get an answer and if you like it, good. If you don't like it, the other problem actually that's systematic is that in proton transfer and bond rearrangement, there is this tendency to overcoordinate that I talked about. And an extreme example, this is not completely remedied even in the hybrid functionals. And in fact, you should expect that DFT barriers will always be too small, right? So you should, and it will always try to overcoordinate. So you should know that going into it. And the, an extreme example of this is the local density approximation predicts that in this simple case of intramolecular proton transfer, there's no barrier at all. The minimum actually is the transition state for proton transfer, right? And it predicts similar things actually in water change as well, that the minimum has the proton in the middle, right? And so there's no barrier to proton transfer, that's the minimum, right? Just to have the hydronium, the proton coordinated. And finally, there isn't really any satisfactory route to um, excited state. Now there's something else we can, I guess I'm probably, no, I'm supposed to keep going. Yeah, okay. So there, the, <laughs> In any case, the, uh, there's, a, there's another sort of suite of techniques that we have to know about before we get into QMMM types of things, and that is these uh, semi-empirical methods. So the basic approximation. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm almost done with one section, so I'm almost done with this section. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, that's all, it's all right, Klaus. I'll decide when to, if I want to remove things. <laughs> okay, so should I continue or should I skip the next five slides? That's the, hmm? Question? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. That's right. Oh, well, that's actually, no, but that, that's, yeah. I think, I think the question, okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's basically something I think it's we think of tennis or biological problems. Mm -hmm. So we can think think of some kind of basic function mm -hmm. to find the idea of the atomic density or I mean the ten rate subject to a interatomic uh, basic function. Like Floating like, orbitals, you mean? Yeah, like you know, but mm -hmm. the question is actually Yes, yes, yes. The uh, floating galaxies yeah, is what they call it. The, okay, the question is whether or not it's better 
instead of, so uh, your point, he points out first that I have this, I set up this dichotomy between fully position localized basis functions and fully momentum localized basis functions, that is to say plane waves and atom centered functions. And he says, okay, he's, he's pointing out that for biological problems that spatial localization is probably very important, and I agree. I, I think I tried to say that. But, the, but then he points out that in addition, perhaps what I really need to do is to include basis functions that are allowed to move off of the atomic center. And that somehow that might give me actually the flexibility that I need in order to converge more quickly. And the answer to that question is, first of all, that people have tried that. And in fact, it's horrifically difficult. One of the reasons it's horrifically difficult, I've actually tried it even, but one of the reasons that it's horrifically difficult is the fact that there's a non, now there's a nonlinear component, which is where should these things be centered. And so you're adding another nonlinear dimension to the problem, where it's, it's, it's strictly linear if actually that's involved just in more basis functions that are fixed. Right? So if you want to put, I mean, there are two ways to do this. One is just to fix them in the midst bond centers, for example. And then they're not, then there is no degree of freedom at the center. Right? And that presumably doesn't give you this problem. But if you allow them to actually variationally move around, then you have a nonlinear variational degree of freedom of the basis functions moving around in space. And those, and that basically just makes it more difficult mathematically and numerically to solve it. All right, so that's the problem number one. If you fix their centers, then what, so that you fix them, they're always in the center of the bonds. And so now you don't have this problem of adding nonlinear component to the problem. Sure. Sure. There is a problem. The problem is that when you solve a set of equations, if it has a nonlinear component, then you are actually making there be multiple minima in the equations you're trying to solve. And you're making it harder to find those minima, right? So the more nonlinearity you introduce into the equation, I mean, you could even argue that the transformation from a linear set of equations to a nonlinear set going from full CI to Hartree Fock that that might be a bad thing. I mean, that would not be, a re that would not be an unreasonable argument. It turns out that it's not true. Yeah, I but think in, in principle, it will work. Mm -hmm. In principle, it will work. In principle, it will work. And technically, I can tell you what happens. What happens is, first of all, it's hard to converge. <coughs> Secondly, that when you do, if you fix them so that you don't have any problems with converging, then what you end up having is linear dependence problems. Because now these basis functions actually look very much like their neighbors again. And so you're actually better off doing an angular, increasing the angular momentum, which is equivalent to that, than you are by just putting more basis functions in the middle. Yes. Right, that you basically will see, that actually is part of the assignment in the, in the lab today. And you'll see that as we go along, but it's pretty easy to state that, first of all, if you have the equilibrium geometry, then that gives you the centers. Remember, we have these springs with equilibrium positions. So all the equilibrium values of the angles and the, and the bonds and so forth, you're gonna get out. The charges actually are, are a more complicated issue, and we'll talk about that towards the end. But there are ways to get charges out. And the problem is that there are 10 different ways and you have to know what to do. The, um, and finally, the, the Van der Waals part, typically you actually would never refit. You would just use Van der Waals that are, um, that are in the parameter file already, right? This, this repulsive part. And the reason for that is that most of the time, those um, Van der Waals forces are not that, they're, they're not that dependent on the molecule. They really are pretty much pairwise added. At the level of accuracy of bio-MD simulations, they're, they're certainly pairwise additive. So there isn't really too much reason to try to refit those. If you wanted to, you could, but, but those same issues actually come up again in um, quantum mechanics. I mean, finally, you're gonna, excuse me, in QMMM. But, the, but finally, you're gonna actually need second derivatives. Right, to get those force constants. And that you get, you get by a second derivative analysis. Now, there are some complexities there, but essentially if you just run, get, set, get the force constant matrix, then you have to, you, it will be in Cartesian coordinates, you have to transform it somehow into internal coordinates, and that's it, right? Those are, that's the answer. 
Mandi, der äh, Richter und Justitore und Vorzüge, die uns in Burkina Faso Fleisch aus Pestica von den Fenstern. As opposed to? As opposed to? They all feel the same way. They just don't feel as badly. But they all, but actually that's why, that, I was only showing that as an extreme example. But they all fail the same way, which is that they underestimate this. And all of them actually, so basically if you take a, a for most proton transfer systems, if you look at the, how the barrier for the proton transfer goes as you go from um, LDA through various GGAs, which all give you similar answers usually. To, um, to a B3 lip, to Hartree Fock, then basically what happens is it starts out negative and then it just starts moving up and becomes really large at Hartree Fock. And the right answer is somewhere in between Hartree Fock and the best density functional theory. But in many cases, the, de the best density functional theory will still give you a barrier which is below the ZPE, the zero point energy, which is effectively no barrier, right? And so without zero point energy, it will give you some barrier, a half a kilocalorie or a kilocalorie. That's what you know, the sort of all best guns that you have. But the, um, what you need to know is not, it's not, this is not a, it's not criticizing, right? So you need to know how these things behave so that you know when you get a value, you say, okay, well, I know that's probably too low, right? And if somebody, and if it turns out that that's above you, with DFT, you calculate a number that's above an experimental number or above some other number, you know that that other number is wrong, right? And that's actually more powerful than, than getting the number on the dot. Can solve the problems correctly. Yeah, solve, solve the quantum mechanical method that is the right one to use <laughs> is uh, is not doable for more than not doable for more than I guess we've done it maybe for forty atoms. But that's so basically the I mean that that so that question of you know, what's the right thing to use is actually that's otherwise see otherwise actually I wouldn't spend any time on this I would just tell you okay. Use DFT with this functional and that basis set, and, they, and then go home, right? You know, don't ask me about why you're using that. And but, and, and that would be eventually, you know, five, ten years from now, we'll get to that point where basically people won't have to know this stuff. But right now, we're not. Right now, we're at the point where actually it's really easy to do the calculations, but it's also really easy to not have a clue what you're doing and to think that you do, right? And that's that's really the issue, right? So you just have to know what you just have to have some sort of lay of the land of what is known to fail in what way and what is known to generally be right. Yes? Van der Waals? Yeah, Van der Waals, the big problem with Van der Waals is, if you have two Van der Waals, the problem, the actually what's really the problem there is the dispersion, right? So what's really the problem is actually the, the London forces and for that, which that's really purely dynamic correlation. And so for that, you really actually need to, if you want to get that right for helium helium, for example, right, which is really the kind of context where you'd want to get that right, then you have to do methods that I didn't even tell you about, right, which are even, which are not applicable beyond five atoms, right? So <laughs> basically, and then you can get it, you can get it to a Kelvin, right? But, but you gotta, you have to put in dynamic correlation in a way that I haven't even started to tell you. So, that's correct. That's correct. Actually, all actually all the methods that we talked about wouldn't get there well. I don't think a single. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I would be shocked if a single method that I mentioned to you would get that well. 
And if it did, it would be only 10 Kelvin, well, we do whatever it would be. I don't know what it actually is in blue and dimer, but it would be, it would be a hundredth of what it should be. And that's, but that's typically not actually that much of an issue in biology. And so in proteins, you don't typically, the dispersion is typically way under the noise of the errors you're making. So, yes. In hybrid, well, you wouldn't. I mean, the only thing you can do in a hybrid, fun again, in density functional theory, the only thing you can do <laughs> is convert to basis set. That you can do. Although there is, there's some, there is actually some, oh, by the way, the question was just how to converge hierarchically in, the, in a hybrid density functional. But the, um, pro the issue there is actually that the convergence, there's good reason to believe that in density functional theory that actually the answers will get worse as the basis set gets better because, and yeah, it sounds terrible, but that's basically because of the density functional theory has some problems empirically. Theoretically, they're supposed to be very big. Empirically, they don't seem to be that big, but it has some problems, that it, at least in principle, with negative ions. And so as you start describing them better and better, they, you can actually run into trouble. And so for density functional theories in general, what you should do is a, is a valence, um, Polarized valence double zeta and a polarized valence triple zeta, and then that's basically where you should stop, or maybe quadruple zeta. But you shouldn't be adding diffuse functions. You shouldn't be going very far above that because it'll it, it won't it'll start it'll make you think it's not converging when really it's just because you're getting you're starting to emphasize other problems. Yes. Well, again, long-range interactions, well, long-range, if you're thinking about long-range interactions, then there are two components to that. One, which any basis set will get as long as the polarizability is well-described, which is basically the, the part that's not purely dynamic correlation. That essentially um, a triple zeta basis set that's adequately polarized, so a CCP VTV basis set should already give you the um, dominant part of that effect, but what it's not, but in order to get the dispersion, again, this goes back to the helium-helium question, in order to get the dispersion right, your basis set is not the issue. The issue is the dynamic correlation. So the issue is actually getting these, getting the induced dipole and induced dipole correct. And that is something that the basis is not gonna help you. You have to move up in, in electron correlation. So, but again, typically the dominant part of that effect well, it depends on how far out you are. If you're far enough out, you're just getting C6, right? And if you just, if you just want to compute C6, the, the, vir the virial coefficient or whatever, then, then it's dispersion that you're after. And then basically you shouldn't be worrying about basis set as much as you, I mean, you have to worry about basis set when you worry about correlation because if the basis set's too small, you don't correlate. But, but it's correlation that you should be thinking about. Yes? Yeah, this is, yeah, then this is actually, well, in principle, no. <laughs> in, the, in principle, the, the force field was fit to the best possible data, and so if you do the best possible job, then you'd be okay. In practice, it's not true, of course. In practice, it's fit to, they're trying, people are actually often taking a force field and trying to put condensed phase, renormalize the condensed phase effects somehow, right? So basically, to scale back the charges is something that often people will do, or scale them up, or whatever. And the, um, and this is something that you have to be consistent with. I mean, you have to do that same procedure. So whenever you go and add parameters to the force field, you should go and read the paper about the original force field and read it carefully and basically follow a similar procedure. The QMMM is actually where that question becomes most damaging, right? Because in QMMM, then you'll see there's a lot of that kind of consistency issue is going to be really important and it's very hard to quantify. Well, I mean, 
the best thing is to find out what counter ion is really there first, right? And then to, and then it becomes a statistical mechanical problem in many senses, right? So rather than, and actually I think that the problem you're referring to is really much more a sampling issue than it is a, a force field issue, right? So how do you actually sample correctly the, the right cloud of distribution of counter ions? I think that the, for the interactions of the, to actually improve the interactions of the, to make sure that you were getting that right, the interactions of the counter ion with the, um, with the DNA backbone, for example, that you could actually, you could actually embark on a program to do that if you wanted, and even putting in, you know, enough solvent that actually there would be some reasonable description of the screening effects. But, um, but I don't think that's the issue. I think the real issue there is much more having to do with the statistical sampling. What about if you have a magnesium detection mm -hmm. with a GPA in a mining mm -hmm. process? So mm -hmm. you know it's there. Mm -hmm. you now you, you see and you want to really describe it well. Mm -hmm. So you go to even topologic searches to get mm -hmm. where the magnesium actually mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But now you would like the ion actually the chemistry of the crystal that actually doesn't have. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How should you know? Oh, well, what you would do, yeah. Process. Okay, sure. If you know exactly where, if you're talking about a case where you know exactly where counter ion is in a protein that's a crystallographic counter ion. And the, um, or ion if you want, and you want actually to parameterize that, then what you basically need to do is take some cut out and then start doing high level electronic structure on that. And then that will actually and parameterize from there, right? And so you can reparameterize it in essentially in an environment specific way. And then you can go and move the environment around, right? You can do this actually, and actually that's pretty, that's pretty robust in the sense that you can do that even with cluster, you can do that even in the absence of QMM. I mean, you can do that just basically taking out you know, essentially the first solvent shell, if you like, which is residues, but um, of the um, protein and do that in the gas phase. And actually, and it should be that if you get, I mean, in fact, it generally works this way, that if, the, if everything is consistent, if you don't have consistency problems with the rest of the force field, then you can do, you can get a really good set of parameters for that, which actually are tuned to the environment that it's in. You have to actually sample over various environments. So what you would, what you would typically do is actually to take a force field that exists, which is a reasonable zeroth order guess, and then to run dynamics and to get snapshots from that and to use those as sampling points for the reparameterization. So then you would do electronic structure calculations on a cutout of this at many points in trajectories that you try to make sure they're not correlated with each other. And then you would use those in a least square fit to actually refit the parameters of the ion, which should probably include some sort of polarizability if you're actually going to, which, which becomes an issue in and of itself because most force fields don't allow you to put in polarizability. But, but, you, but in principle, you can do it, and actually in practice you can do it in some force fields, and you can also make it quantum mechanical and then do the same game, where you would treat the counter ion quantum mechanically, but then you, the basis set you would use for it, which is another thing I haven't talked about very much, but you can actually tune the basis set you use for a subsystem in such a way that is equivalent to parameterizing it. Right, so it's wrong, <laughs> but you choose it actually to be wrong in the way that actually cancels other errors. In the same way that 321G magically works and gives you the geometries right, you can choose a basis set that actually magically gives you the right polarization even though, the, um, even though other properties are not perfect. But, that's, but you can force it to cancel errors the way you want. And so that's the sort of way that. Okay, what I would like to suggest for it is mm -hmm. we did actually also a previous Uh -huh. We make it okay. a little bit briefer, mm -hmm. and uh, I would say we meet them in 20 minutes, and we will start to get in the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it was a lot of useful information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be able to actually talk to a few of the...